Hello everyone. Welcome to the Module 5 Instructor Presentation for the Sensation and Perception course. Once again, I wanted to go over some of the major themes and concepts that are part of this module. This uh, module, Module 5, we cover the uh, introduction to motion and color perception. And the themes that I want to emphasize, uh, some of which you've seen before, so they can almost be a, a, almost a course level theme. The retinal stimulus is ambiguous. All right, this was something I mentioned before, but this is really um, elaborated on in these uh, in these two areas of perception in terms of color and motion. Uh, I guess the point I, I keep trying to make throughout the course is that what we experience cannot just be uh, based solely on um, solely on the uh, incoming sensory information. There has to be something else going on. Um, of course, I also want to go over, you know, in terms of motion and color, what are the uh, important functions these have for us in daily living, the physiological basis for motion and color perception. And finally, this last point, which kind of ties in with one, motion and color perception are the creation of the nervous system. This, this uh, point uh, is in reference to the philosophical positions of what we call naive realism, versus a more subjective approach, and I'll get into that later. All right, so what about motion perception? Uh, there's a lot of slides here, and I'm going to not spend a whole lot of time on each particular one, but uh, I would also like to mention, if I haven't mentioned before, that all of these slides that are aligned with the textbook will be available uh, to download for you, so you'll be able to have them unaltered and, and view them, so you don't, don't feel like you can only see them on these particular uh, uh, YouTube lectures. Okay, so perception of motion. Here you can see some examples of, of a, what we think is a people moving. Um, motion is an interesting perception. Um, and when we think about the function of motion, uh, we need motion to signal the presence of an object in the environment. All right, so this is all relates to the survival aspect of being able to perceive uh, motion. And this will also come back when we talk about color. Both have important functions. Predators use movement of prey as a primary means of location. That's definitely the case. Um, often, the movement of an object can signal its presence. And we call this attentional capture. Motion attracts attention to the moving object. Uh, if prey remains motionless, it is less likely to be noticed. You know, this was um, a, a fun little plot device that was in the original Jurassic Park movie back in the early 90s, where the T-Rex is chasing him. And I, and I remember, is it a doctor... Um, uh, you know, one of the uh, the, the PhDs, uh, his name escapes you right now, but um, the uh, uh, the one who studied the dinosaurs, uh, played by Sam Neill, the actor, he kept saying, "Look, don't." When, it, when the T Rex is chasing me, he's like, "Don't, don't move." Its vision is based on movement. If you don't move, it, it won't see you. So there's the the tension that's caused by having to remain still while this giant thing's trying to get you. Um, so that's definitely true. So motion can signal the presence of of something in the environment. Um, we know, for example, the peripheral retina uh, is sensitive to the to a moving stimulus, and it kind of attracts it. And then, and as, as humans, we tend to look and then foveate towards that to towards the object to see what it is. Um, and here you can see this is sort of interesting. Um, this is the leaf tail gecko. This is really interesting. This you can almost see the creature there, but this is a creature that's clearly evolved to look like its surroundings. Um, but if it were to move. And the same thing here with the little seahorse right there. As soon as they move, it's a dead giveaway that there's something there. But it's, this is a really interesting example of defensive evolution right there. Um, so movement can signal the presence of an object. Um, be aware in the book that, that you know your author makes a distinction between real motion and sort of fake motion. Real is what you might think. An object is actually moving in the universe. Illusory is apparent movement. This is um, the movement that is uh, induced. It's an illusion, essentially, created by watching television. Um, you know, when you're watching a film, for example, you're seeing a series of uh, frames. It's a bunch of still images that are presented sequentially. So a uh, film, for example, is generally presented at 24 frames per second. Um, but it's enough to where we get the illusion that, that things appear to be moving. So uh, that's just something to consider. So what's interesting, one of the things your, your text goes into, I'm not going to spend much time on it right now, but your text goes into, well, what about how does the brain kind of know something, you know, to, so to speak, how does it know something is really moving versus illusory? And it's kind of interesting that some parts of the brain that, that respond to real motion 
also will have similar responses to illusory motion. So once again, that's going to go back here again to this point. Color and motion perception, and other types of perception as well, but just for now the focus is on these two, are the creation of the nervous system to a certain extent. Um, and here you can see some examples. This is a, uh, like a marquee as it moves. This is not really motion that, w that would occur here. It's just a sequential, there's are lights being, um, being activated sequentially uh, in different locations, and that creates the sense of movement. Um, and here you can see some other examples. You can look through some of these things in the books. It's sort of interesting, a motion after effect. Uh, this is the so-called waterfall illusion. Once again, this still, you cannot do it, but if you were to stare at this waterfall for a you know, little bit of time and then look away, you would see an opponent process where you would see what looks like the water going upwards, which is sort of interesting. Uh, when that, that, once again, that's there to give us some clues as to how the brain is actually processing this. It's almost like a opponent processes going on in the brain. Um, what about motion perception in the brain, though? And this is something that you have to do, you have to spend some time in this module studying, and that's, you know, what are the some of the parts of the brain that, you know, the physiology of motion perception? Uh, we know in the striate cortex, which is in the occipital lobe, that you have cells there, um, feature detectors that will tend to get excited by moving lines or edges and so forth. As we get further down in the system, as we get further along in the visual system, the neurons become increasingly more specialized. Um, and that one of those areas of specialization that's explored in your text is the middle temporal area, the MT. Uh, a lot of this research was done with monkeys. Uh, a lot of, uh, and this was the classic Newsom and Perry uh, research that was done back in the 1980s. Um, and they, use, using a lot of ingenious methods, were able to figure out that the MT seems to be uh, largely responsible for what I like to call two-dimensional motion perception. And they use this coherence of movement of dot patterns, and that's shown here. Uh, also, the YouTube video I have on biological motion from uh, Johansson, that's also in the module, you can actually see some examples of this type of stimuli. So that's uh, one of the reasons why I have it posted for you. Fascinating stuff. Um, but... Essentially, what Newsom and Perry did was you know, train monkeys on looking at these dots, and they can have the dots all kind of moving randomly, or half the dots, in this case, are moving upward. In this case, all of the dots are moving upward, and they would be trained to, to indicate the direction of the dots, and then they get rewarded with some food. And um, So they had to, this, so it was a behavioral task, which is sort of interesting here. Monkeys are trained to judge dot, direction of dot movements. Um, the firing of the MT, so recording from the uh, middle temporal lobe, correlated. The, you know, the uh, as that as those cells in the MT started firing, you know, that this was related to the coherence of dot movement. So, and it was related to the movement accuracy. Uh, the judgment of that um, was related to MT. So this is some physiological evidence that the uh, MT is involved with this. Uh, incidentally, if you damage the MT, monkeys have a harder and harder time on this task. So if you, so it's, um, and it's stimulation, by the way, if you sort of give it a little uh, extra juice, to hel helped improve performance, which is sort of interesting. So, but here you can see uh, normal monkeys in their task after training can detect coherence at, at as little as one or 2%. So that means only a couple of dots in the field have to be moving in that, uh, in the same direction to be noticed. Um this threshold is increased, right? So monkeys with lesions, you need to make the coherence up to 10 or 20%, at least for a while. So that gives us some idea that this part of the brain is involved with at least a, a certain aspect of motion perception. Um, and once again, you should go in your text, make note of some of these other studies, um, looking at um, the effects of stimulation. Here's microstimulation. That's where you can literally just go in and stimulate a uh, you know, one or a handful of neurons and so forth, and that's what's explored in your text. Um, but what what this research group found, and this is uh, Britain et al. in 1992, um, they could manipulate the monkey's perception through the stimulation of the neurons. All right, so that's very interesting, and that's what they show here. So the perception of movement can be altered through stimulation of the cells in the uh, motion parts, in the uh, motion areas of the brain, so to speak. Uh, another area that's, that that um, is interesting is motion in the body, and this is formed um, from motion. And I have a separate activity in the course for you to look at, and that's also related to the uh, work that Johansson had started back in the early 1970s. Uh, his lab and uh, located that was located in Sweden. Um, 
movement can be, you know, movement can in, give us clues. The way things move can give us clues as to not just the fact that it's there or that it's in the location of the thing, and the, it, but it can also provide us with information about the actual identity of the object. You know, you know, for a while in the course, I kind of separated the two. Here you got uh, form identification. You know, when we talk about the so-called what and where pathways, which is a little bit of an oversimplification, but that's how a lot of this, how a lot of the, in these courses, we kind of talk about the visual system. It's almost like the, the two things are separate, but they're not in, in a sense. You have to, you know, there are times when having motion present can provide a dead giveaway of what that object is, or at least it can help. And one of that, uh, one of those, uh, one phenomenon here is the so-called biological motion. And this is, this you know, basically, if we look at people, whether or not we're looking at children, we're looking at different animals, we're looking at uh, males versus females, they all have, you know, we find that, and this also could be related to individuals as well, we have our sort of individual gait, the way we walk, and that can provide a clue as to what, you know, the form or the identification of that person. And this was uh, achieved through what are called point light walker stimulus. And I have videos on the course where you can see these things. You place lights in specific parts, uh, in, usually in the joints. And through the movement, you know, first it's just a bunch of, of dots, but then through the movement, all of a sudden the form becomes, uh, it sort of takes a life of its own. It's kind of interesting. So we call this structure from motion. Um, and we have a specific, you can see there's certain parts of the brain, the superior temporal sulcus and the fusiform face area, interestingly enough, uh, tend to show elevated activity um, when point light walker stimuli are, are shown. All right. And you can see here. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of going through some of these other slides. Oh, uh, yeah. This participants view point light walker. Um, here you can see um, this was done with humans. This is uh, Grossman et al., Transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is a, a way to use a magnetic field to um, stimulate uh, cortical areas. This is a non-invasive technique. Um, you know, this in this case, when the when Grossman applied this stimuli to the superior temporal sulcus of uh, humans, it caused a decrease in the ability to detect biological motion. What this does is essentially blunts that area of the brain for a while. It can maybe lower the activity temporarily. And during that time, when it was sort of blunted for a little bit, almost like put to sleep, um, there was a temporary deficit in that ability. So that gives us a clue that the STS might be important for the perception of biological motion. And here you can see those an example of the, po of the point light walker stimuli. Once again, I have the video where you can actually see this move. Um, as soon as these stimuli move, you know right away you're probably you're looking at, at a human. Um, and so forth. And this is a nice little summary of motion in the body. Once again, this relates to in form from motion, structure from motion, but particular importance for us is, of course, recognizing other people, their facial expressions, their, their, and their movements can provide clues. Um, striate cortex, this is more the feature detector. You can see there's those lines again, back when we learned in uh, chapters three and four. Uh, middle temporal, you can see direction and speed of motion. Um, there's the MST, the medial superior temporal area. This is all part of the temporal areas you can see. Um, location of objects, reaching for moving objects and stuff like that. And here you can see the STS, perception of motion related to animals and people. So biological motion, very interesting stuff. Um, now moving on to color, color perception. What is the function of color perception? Well, um, color, possibly even more so than the motion of an object, really helps us classify and identify objects in the environment. Um, it facilitates perceptual organization of, el of elements into objects. Uh, I would also like to mention that motion also is involved with the perceptual organization of objects. Um, and having color vision that we primates have, and humans and such, probably gave us a, an advantage in terms of natural selection and getting food. And, th and this is a, demonstrated by this picture here. Here you can see, this is the same, looks like berries, obviously, and on this side here in A, the same image without color, it's harder, it's, excuse me, it's harder to discern the berries from the background. I guess you can see them there, but it's much more difficult, at least with this particular photograph. Uh, so that gives us a sense that, you know, that color provides enhanced contrast of objects. It really, and, and contrast means I can tell the difference between this 
part and then the green part. That really helps with contrast. And in this case, this this is not just for aesthetic. You know, it, I think that the color is always aesthetically pleasing, but it's actually helpful for survival. So there's probably an evolved tendency to have color vision with humans and other primates. Uh, in our environment, it, it was important. It's important, you know. Um, one thing to note as you study the chapter, note uh, some of this information on reflectance and so forth. Light is generally reflected off of objects. That's most of the light you're experiencing in the, in, let's say, your bedroom or wherever you're at, your study as you look at these things uh, or whatever part of the house, whatever. As you go about, there's transmitted light, of course, from the sun or another source of light like a, ton, like a, like a light bulb or whatnot. But what generally happens is you have reflection or more, like, more specifically selective reflection of these uh, of the wavelengths off of those objects and we can divide and among with the wavelengths that are reflected we can have colors that are let's say your chromatic colors and these are the you know the colors we tend to think of your blues your reds your greens and whatnot there's also achromatic which is essentially black white and gray um, but the ex one of the factors in our perception of color is the extent to which particular wavelengths are either absorbed by an object and then how much of those wavelengths are reflected, which is shown in this picture here. So if I'm looking at, let's say, a piece of white paper, what we find is that pretty much all the various wavelengths in the visible spectrum, going from 400 to 700 approximately, you know, nanometers, um, they're reflected in equal amounts. Okay, if I'm looking at, let's say, some, I'm, I'm assuming this is supposed to be some sort of like red paper, you're going to get a bit more percentage of the longer wavelengths reflected off and the other wavelengths tend to be absorbed a bit more. Okay, same thing, same thing in principle is going to happen with transmission as well. So the idea is that a certain amount of uh, wavelengths are absorbed typically by objects and a certain amount are reflected. So if you're looking at a tomato, it's going to tend to reflect more of the longer wavelengths and that's what's shown, I believe, here. Or no, no, it's not here. Yeah, oh, actually, yes, yes, it is. Here's the tomato. Obviously, the orange and the reds tend to get reflected more, assuming it's that particular kind of tomato. Lettuce, obviously, generally we experience it as green, so we tend to reflect more of these medium wavelengths. And here you see the difference with the achromatics, white versus gray versus black. Black tends to absorb a lot. Um, that's typically why colors are grays and blacks for winter clothes, because they tend to absorb those wavelengths more and might keep you a little warmer. White is more of a summer. You know, that tends to reflect off the wavelengths, help keep you cooled off, too. Okay, so that makes some sense there. Uh, and then you can see that, yes, yeah, so, you know, it's look over the reflectance and transmission. Um, and also color mixing is sort of interesting. Uh, this is important. Look over the color mixing material because it's important for uh, understanding of how we perceive colors, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, you know, and also, you know, take note of the different perceptual dimensions of color. Once again, the physical dimension is simply the wavelength of light. That's where it all starts. The wavelength of light, 400 to 700 nanometers. Um, but then we can talk about more perceptual aspects, the hue, the saturation and stuff like that, which is mentioned in your text. Um, the hue is essentially what we think that that's defined as the specific color. It is a red hue. It is a blue hue. Saturation is the vibrancy of the color. Highly saturated colors appear to be more bright and vibrant looking. Um, less saturation, they, they tend to get whited out. So think about you, you bought some clothes, but you, they, they're worn out through the years. All the washing, they've lost that, that saturation. Okay. Um, so let's see, moving right along here. What are some of the theories of color vision? How is it that we experience color? Uh, be aware of the young Helmholtz theory. Helmholtz, of course, is one of the greatest scientists of the uh, 19th century. Um, came up with the trichromatic theory. Color vision is based on three principal colors, your red, blues, and your greens, and so forth. And he asserted we had three different receptor mechanisms. And he was able to, uh, to uh, conclude this based on ingenious behavioral studies were, uh, that were done called color matching ex uh, experiments. These are really interesting, and that's shown here. Um, in this particular experiment, what um, you can see this was done by Maxwell. Participants that had normal color vision, okay, so we're not talking about people that have color deficiencies, which I'll make, I'll make a point about in a minute here. 
Um, they adjusted amounts of different wavelengths in a comparison field to match a test field that was presented as one wavelength. So here's a test field over here that's shown. You can see it's a 500 nanometer, which is right in the middle there. It's a, generally per, be perceived as green. So they've shown that. And then here, their job was, given these three projectors, was, okay, let's see if I can match this comparison to look just like the test. All right? And they were able to do this as long as they had the uh, the three, all right? So that's what they did. They adjusted the amounts of different wavelengths in a comparison field to match the test field. And so what did they find? Results show that adjustments of three wavelengths in the comparison field, any reference color could be matched if you had three. If there were just two, only some of the colors could be matched. So this in more or less is consistent with the Helmholtz trichromatic theory. Color vision depends on three receptor mechanisms, each with different spectral sensitivities. Um, and this has been more or less confirmed through the physiology of the cone system. So we know the cones have three different types of, uh, of um, receptors. What's interesting about this, um, and th this is a point to make here, here you see this, I, I want to make sure you understand this, that here you have three stimuli here making that, that that produces this green field, essentially. You have the 420, the 560, and the 640 nanometers being overlapped. This is a different stimulus. You know, B is a, and, you know, it's a different physical stimulus than A. Okay, it's a different physical stimulus. You know, 500 is not a simple average of these three or something like that. These are not equivalent stimuli. Yet, the human observer will think it's the same thing, okay? This is referred to as a metamer. You have two different, physically different stimuli, but they are perceived as the same color in this case. That is a metamer, all right? So um, the point here is that if you can create this uh, a similar pattern of activation in your visual system, regardless of the stimulus, right? If the, if the pattern of activation is the same, you're gonna think it's the same thing, all right? Even though these two stimuli are physically different, and that's called a metamer. So once again, that kind of supports that point I'm trying to make that color experience is the product, and, and the same thing with motion. It is a product of the neural circuitry. It's a product of, the, of, of, of neural mechanisms. Okay. So let me move on here. And once again, there's the, I mentioned that before. These are the, the wavelengths. And here you can see, uh, the, excuse me, the cones responding to different wavelengths. Here you can see the... Uh, uh, relative absorption spectra. So you have uh, the short, medium, and long wavelength cones. And you can see, so the pattern of activity of these three. So if I'm looking at something, let's say more on the red side, you're going to get more activity if, from the L, a little bit less in the M, and even less in the S. That's the idea. Um, so that's, once again, this is, and here's the metamer concept. Be aware of that. Color matching experiments show that colors that are perceptually similar can be caused by different physical wavelengths. So that's uh, interesting. So you want to go through some of this material in your book. And once again, it's that pattern of activity, pattern of activity. And here is that again. If I get the same pattern of activity, even though these two stimuli are, are different, perceptually they're going to be identical. In a sense, it's we're being fooled. Um, if we have less than three functioning receptor types, you have a color blindness. Okay, this typically occurs in males. Um, it can be uh, carried by a female. Females can have this, but it's much more unusual. Um, but here you can see there's monochromats, dichromats, and uh, yeah, and so forth. Di you know, most color deficiencies, one or more of the uh, cone types just doesn't work properly. So they're, they essentially have more metamers, essentially. With, when you have less than three cone types, you have more and more metamers, so everything starts to look the same, right? At least that's the idea. All right. Uh, another theory to look at, which applies more to how uh, retinal ganglion cells work in, in certain parts of the brain, certain cells in like uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus and other parts of the brain or in the visual cortex, opponent process theory. Okay. And this is, we have opponent colors like blue, yellow, green, and red, and so forth. Um, so make sure you look at that. And I want to just, and you can go through this, you can see these are, we generally find, for example, that red and green are opposing colors. Uh, which is interesting. Blue and yellow are opposing. White and black are opposing colors. Um, evidence for this uh, tends to come from uh, the way that neurons tend to work. 
like I said, in the retina and the LGN, you know, here's the main point where they might respond in an excitatory manner to one particular, uh, let's say longer wavelengths, and then they'll show an inhibition to a shorter wavelength, whatnot. So that could be something like a red green opponent process and whatnot. And once again, this is, you know, so be sure to look at that. Um, Main point here, trichromatic tends to do well explaining how the cones work. Opponent process, more about how the neural circuitry works in the brain. And that's sort of shown here uh, and so forth. Okay, so color in the cortex. Color in the cortex. There's no single module for color perception. A lot of different parts of the brain tend to, resp tend to play a role in uh, color perception, which is something to note. And here you can see some of the parts that are shown with the MRI. Mm. This was done fairly recently, 2010. Um, you can see that we have parts of the brain that are uh, responding to the color of an object, parts of the brain that tend to m respond more to the shape and so forth, texture. All of these areas, of course, working together so that we can uh, identify objects in the world. Now here, um, color constancy. This is one of the more, to me, it's the most important part of the chapter. I keep saying that Color, motion, these are these perceptual experiences are the result of how the brain itself works. All right. I'm not saying that the environment is not important. I'm not saying that at all. But if our brain worked differently or our mind worked differently, however you want to look at this, our experience in the universe would be different. Uh, one of the things that's quite important is have various uh, constancy mechanisms in place so that the world becomes a bit more stable doesn't become as confusing. Uh, we have shape constancy, lightness constancy, size constancy, and we also have color constancy. Perception of colors is relatively constant in spite of changing light sources. So if light sources change, whether or not we're talking about the daytime or the nighttime, we get different reflectance depending on the light source. All right. The thing about that is even though there's different reflectance, and this is shown here, you get different reflectance, you could have... Um, you know, if, if all that mattered was the, the reflected light, then objects would change their colors throughout the day constantly. And that would make things very confusing. I mean, imagine, you know, trying to forage for food. If the berries are red one, one time, then they kind of look orange the next. You'd have a hard time figuring out, well, what is this thing? Is it still okay to eat? Um, but we have constancy mechanisms in place that are likely due to certain cortical mechanisms that keep that color experience to be relatively stable. Now... And one of those processes is probably something called chromatic adaptation. Prolonged exposure to a particular color leads to receptors, quote unquote, adapting. Okay. This means you certainly have kind of worn out one part of the system and then you get an overall decrease in sensitivity to that color. Uh, there's a demonstration in your text, and I, ask, I have it in the module as well, which you can do that. Um, one theory is that this adaptation process leads to color constancy. Um, and here you can see uh, I have a link um, on here, the ambiguity of color perception. And this relates to um, one of the uh, activities I had you do in, in the module, and that's the, the, the dress phenomenon. That was the uh, uh, phenomenon uh, back in 2015 when folks looked at this dress right here. Actually, these are there's two images here. They looked at this, and people were arguing as to what the color, you know, what the color was. And I have a link for you on the website, and you can you know check this out. But this particular scientist argues that one of the reasons why people see this differently is that we that maybe there's some differences in how constancy mechanisms work between individuals, and that's what he talks about there. That that you know, and actually no one I don't think there's actually an adequate answer why some folks. We'll see this dress in one particular color pattern than another. Um, I happen to see it more like this when I see the original photo. Uh, some folks see it more like this. Um, but it has to do with a cortical mechanism. It has to do somehow um, the way that um, at a perceptual level, the way some people's brains work is different than the others. And it's just sort of interesting. Um, but anyway, I'll have that link for you so you can uh, check that out. But this relates to color constancy mechanisms. Um, and that leads me to the final uh, point here, the final slide. Physical energy in the environment does not have perceptual qualities. Light waves are not colored. They're just, it's just a wavelength. We, the way our brains work, the way our minds work, we add that subjective experience to it. 
different nervous systems experience different perceptions. And that's exactly what that dress phenomenon showed is that generally speaking, since we're all homo sapiens, we're all going to experience the world in a pretty similar way. That That's which is necessary. Otherwise, communication and the ability to relate to other people would be almost impossible. But obviously, there are some differences. And, so, and you know, the, the dress thing is sort of trivial in a sense that it doesn't really matter. Um, not really, but it does illustrate that, and I keep saying this point, that perception, to a, a significant extent, is a subjective experience. Um, you know, and this is demonstrated by some of the findings in the book. Um, Honeybees can perceive color that is outside our perception, right? So they experience more of the ultraviolet. We don't experience that. Their universe is entirely different for them. So um, those are some of the major themes. And uh, you have a great week.